Hi, I'm Diane Hullett. Welcome to the Best Life, Best Death podcast. Today, I've got a really interesting guest, and she's part of my third Thursday talking about body disposition kind of jag that I've been on for several months. So hi, Cece. Hi, Diane. So nice to see you. Well, this is fun. So Cece and I met over Instagram, basically, and Cece Boyce is a woodworker working out of Los Angeles, right? Maybe maybe you want to even be more specific about which part. And, um, you know, Cece's got a really beautiful small studio and a very specific thing that she does, but I think it's such a beautiful solution for what to do with cremated remains or aquamated remains. So tell us, introduce yourself, Cece, tell us about yourself. So I'm Cece. I live here in Los Angeles, uh, downtown Los Angeles. I live and work both in downtown Los Angeles, which is really nice because I can ride my bike to work every day in such a car central city. It's really nice to uh, be able to do that. Um, and yeah, I make um, cremation urns that double as decorative planters. So when somebody asks me like, oh, you're a woodworker. What do you make? I say cremation urns. And then I immediately have to pull up my Instagram and show them but not what you think, you know, and because they kind of give you a face and you have to say, oh, but, but they're geometric and they have a plant on top and they don't look like urns. And then they go, oh, OK, yeah, well, cool. What a great idea. Right, right. Interesting. Well, how did you like I, I was drawn to them on Instagram when I saw them because they're just these beautiful, warm, like you said, kind of offset geometric shapes. How did you get into woodworking? Like that's not necessarily a career everybody launches into. Well, my dad was a woodworker and I grew up doing that. We had a, a wood shop in the basement of our house. So I grew up making things. My dad made a lot of stuff in our house, which I assisted him on. And, you know, throughout my life and through college, I was always the one like making stuff. I was the one putting up shelves or making my own bed. So I, I was doing that kind of my whole life. I didn't really start doing it as a career until about 2013. I had come to Los Angeles and I was an actor. I did a lot of commercials and voiceovers and I had a lot of success with that. Um, but then that kind of started to fade out and not be so enjoyable for me. And so I went back to school for woodworking here in California. I went to a community college who had, that has a really great shop and a really great program, El Camino College. And uh, just started making stuff there. And I when digress, I digress into that for a moment, like what, oh, sure. did they just have more tools than you had access to before, or did they, were they providing, um, like ideas for projects or were you bringing your creativity to them and saying, how do I execute this? Yeah, exactly. I would take, uh, what I wanted to make, and then I would learn the skills necessary to make that thing. So it's a kind of a different uh, process. Some some schools say, okay, first you're going to make this, and then you're going to make this, and then you're going to make this. This program was more like, what do you want to make? Because some people are coming in with different skill sets. Some people had been around big machines like I had and were very comfortable around stuff like that. Some people were very, very new and were using how to use a table saw for the first time or you know, the band saw for the first time. And so that's what really direct me towards that program because I didn't want to start out, you know, making a cutting board or I didn't want to start making, you know, something that I didn't need. That's part of my philosophy, you know, about the fact that I use urban lumber and I try to use every part of, of the piece of lumber with very little waste. Um, I don't like creating waste and I don't, and also woodworkers become hoarders because we can never throw in a piece of good wood away. And so um, I didn't want to make something that wasn't going to be used. I didn't want to make something that was just going to, you know, be thrown away or sit on the shelf. I wanted to make something that was useful to me. And, and that uh, program allowed me to do that, which I was really happy about. That sounds amazing. I, I'm struck by um, sewing people have a similar kind of hoarding problem. And I, uh, I make stuff with fabric. And a friend of mine and I were laughing the other day because she read this quote, or maybe she heard it on a podcast where basically they said, the materials that you hoard are like clutter is basically potential projects. Yes. <laughs> Not going to actually do the project, get rid of the clutter and let, you know, let it be someone else's treasure to find. Cause you're holding onto this fabric. You're never going to use. So right. I can right. totally see that with wood woodworkers too. It's like, well, I cut down this tree in my yard and I've just got to hang on to the mm -hmm. X, Y, Z random slabs. 
Yeah. Well, the worst thing is when I do use a piece that I've been holding on for three years or four years and I'm like, see, I, I, I'm justified. I'm justified <laughs> in using this. See, I knew I was going to use it. It someday. does. It rationalizes the clutter, doesn't it? <laughs> say, say more about what's urban wood. So urban wood is, it's different than reclaimed. They call it rescued wood. So I work with a couple lumber yards here in Los Angeles and in Anaheim that find trees that either, you know, it might be something that's going to be demolished or a tree that's sick, a tree that fell down um, in a storm, something like that. A tree that would have usually just been gone in the chipper and, and into the landfill. These uh, lumber companies take those pieces, or take those trees, cut them up, dry them, and sell them to woodworkers. So it's trees that would have been nothing now made into something thanks to their efforts. And so the reclaimed is wood that has been used before and salvaged, um, but I don't like, use them. Like bleacher seats or a barn or something like that. This is more like a tree that was going to get chipped and instead they've made it useful. That's exactly so, right. That's so neat. And it, it allows me to work with a lot of different woods too that I wouldn't have access to otherwise. California has some really cool woods. So, uh, you know, it's in sh shorter supply, but um, I'm able to work with California sycamore or sweet gum or elm. These are usually woods that you can't find at, at a commercial lumber yard. So uh, it's really allowed me to experiment and learn about new trees and learn about different species and how they how to work with them, which ones look good with which ones, because with the urns, the, the bottom and the top are different colors. So finding out oh, elm can come in kind of three or four different shades. And what do I use with this one? You know, so it's it's actually a creative challenge for me as well to find what's going to look good with this particular wood. Right, like a pairing process. I think that was your first video that I saw on Instagram mm -hmm. was you were saying, how do I choose, how do I choose what pieces of wood to go together? And you were putting them together and showing like, well, this is okay, but it doesn't really sing. And this one, and eh, that really doesn't work. And then a third color and texture and the, the way the uh, lines of the wood work together, you were like, this is it. This one's good. Right. So yeah. it was really, I loved that little Instagram video of just kind of seeing your process as an artist of why you chose what you chose. Okay. So you get these new skills, you go to this community college woodworking program, but how did you come to Earns? So that was a few years later. I was doing mostly custom work. I was making like tables for restaurants and, and, and custom stuff for people. And a friend of mine's father had passed away and they were dispersing the ashes amongst family members. And at the time I made these geometric planters that just held like kind of a small succulent. They were again, pieces of wood that I would glue together um, that were left over from my custom projects because I didn't want to waste them and I didn't want to become a hoarder. So I would just glue pieces together and make different shapes out of them. They liked those uh, planters. So they were like, can you just make us a, a few of those and, and put an extra hole in it and we'll, we'll stuff the ashes inside. And I said, no, no, let me, let me see if I can design something for you. Let me, let me, this sounds like a cool project. So I, fiddled with it for a while and I end up making um, this, this, this shape. It's actually this shape. This is the, this was the first shape and I put it up on Instagram and it got a big response from the deaf care community. Where can I get this? What is this? And, you know, something that I thought was just going to be a one-off ended up being a whole new career. And so I did uh, about a year of diving into, you know, talking to death doulas and pet morticians and, you know, touring a crematory to see like, oh, how much, you know, remains is a human body. And so finding the different sizes that I needed for pets and for people, and then finding shapes that would work with, with those, with that sizing. So there's like small, medium, large, um, for people who are either dispersing the ashes amongst family members or, um, you know, you know, or pets, and so, yeah, that took me about a year to, you know, for prototyping and research. And I really got into it. I was really surprisingly like, wow, this is really interesting. And again, a design challenge because you have something very specific that you need to hold. You need to hold it securely and it needs to be in the right proportion and it needs to be, you know, in an interesting shape. So it was, it was quite a challenge um, that I really loved doing. I've, I've been trying to find 
another, because right now the large is only come in one shape and I've been trying to determine another shape for the large for about a year now, like trying like different shapes and it's, and nothing has been quite right. So it is a very time consuming thing. That's so neat. And yours are, I mean, is that a rhombus? Is that what we'd call that? Like, I guess, I guess I, like some of them are like, some of our, like a trapezoid. Trapezoid. Guess, Maybe like it's a, a trapezoid. trapezoid. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah. But they're all, like you said before, asymmetrical. So nothing is, nothing is perfectly symmetric. And then uh, I have these that are kind of, you know, um, they're tr it's triangular, but it, it's, it's um, inspired by uh, those pyramids with the top chopped off. So this is, you know, kind of, again, like in that theme of, of burial or death, but, you know, kind of up the, updating it, making it smaller in that way. Tell us about the, how the top attaches to the bottom. So they're attached by rare earth magnets. So the, they're, they're really strong, as you can see, they're like very, so I hide the magnets. So I drill the, the holes into, into the bottom. And then I put the magnets in there and then I make plugs from the same piece of wood that I use. So they're hidden. So you don't see them and then, uh, and then do the same thing for, for the top and then they're held together. So they, if it's, you know, if it falls over, it's not going to open up. If it falls off of a shelf onto the floor, obviously it's, it's right. going to, Maybe but I, so. yeah, but I, I always advise people and I provide a muslin bag again, kind of with you know muslin shroud kind of keeping with that with that theme i provide a muslin bag with all of the urns to keep the remains in just to keep them extra secure and it looks nicer i think yeah, yeah. than the urn than the a plastic little, bag a that you tidier get. yeah a little tidier yeah. and mm -hmm. and one of those is large enough to put remains in it does seem yeah. so tiny i mean not yeah. tiny but like it seems like it'd be a little tight yeah this one is for a pet or it could be like for a, an infant the one that's the, for a person would be this guy. I so see. Oh, yeah, yeah. So that is bigger. Yeah. So then this one is built differently. So oh. this, this, is built, this is built like a box. So the small ones are a piece of wood that has a hole drilled in the middle, but um, the mediums and the larges are are built like a box. So yeah. Got it. So it's a box with a lid that goes on okay. top of those same right. magnets. Right. And then that's where the plant goes right there. How did you come up with the idea of putting a plant in the top? And these are called plant urns, right? Plant and you've urns, got that yeah. like, you've got that like TM. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a little on the nose, I know, but I, I a friend of mine who was a writer was like, we got to find a different name for these. There's two on the nose. I said, okay, fine. Think of something. And she couldn't. She's like, yeah, you're right. No, that's the best name. It's good. It's good. Yeah. I think it, it stemmed from my the planters that I was making before that were the cutoffs of my other projects. They are kind of just an extension of those. And obviously these plants, the holes for these plants are, are larger than the other ones before. The other ones were like, like a tea light holder, but this is, you know, this is about three inches in diameter and two, two and a half inches tall. So you can fit a really good size plant in there. I just, I just bought one from the flower mart today to kind of show you you know, that you can have a really, you know, oh, decent yeah. sized plants in there. Yeah. I imagine you have to be a little careful with the watering component. Yes. Yes. That's exactly right. I, I, what I usually do is I take a, um, a squirt bottle and just kind of squirt either. You can take the, the cup out to water it if you want, but not everybody wants to do that. So I just do a squirt bottle right at the base and that way it doesn't overflow. Right. You don't want to dump in water and overflow, but I can see it is protected. Right. Even if it did overflow, it's not like it's going down into the lower half. Exactly. Exactly. Well, I love, I mean, I've seen so many unique urns that are um, like beautiful hand-shaped ceramic vessels, or, you know, people are making incredible blown glass now, which yeah. is urn per se, but, um, but I think yours is just especially earthy and warm and the fact that you can put a plant in the top really personalizes it. Cause I can imagine, you, you know, like I, for example, have a huge aloe plant and I'm like, well, wouldn't it be cool if everybody got a little bit of ashes and an aloe plant from my, you know, my aloe plant or a jade plant or some other kind of mm -hmm. succulent that um, multiplies so easily like hens and chicks. Yeah. Actually, that's happened a lot. I've had people, um, I had one um, family whose uh, the decedent was a, bo a master bonsai guy. He had tons and they sent me some pictures of the bonsai trees. So they put one of his bonsai in there, which was really, really cool. And I get a lot of messages from people saying, my mom was a gardener or my dad was an outdoorsman. And so this is just perfect for him. It's really a nice reminder of that person without being a painful 
you know, reminders. You know, sometimes if you look at something maybe that's traditionally an urn that you're reminded of that's what it is. Do you know what I mean? Like I have a friend who uh, keeps a portion of her friend in, in one of the urns and I was really curious. I, I said, so when you water the plant, do you always know it's David in there? Do you always, and she said about half and half. She said, sometimes I'm just watering a plant and sometimes I remember that David is in there. And, and I was like, that's beautiful. That's great. I think that that is, I think exactly what, what, what I wanted. Right, right. I, I, it's so fun to hear you say that you're kind of experimenting with other shapes, but this continues to be the one that feels like your trademark shape. Mm -hmm. And yeah, what shapes are there that you can do with wood? Have you ever thought about doing one of those that's like a, um, what are those knots on a tree called when the tree grows and then it's got a big bump? Um, yeah, I guess, yeah, it's just a knot. Yeah. Yeah. Like uh -huh. I can imagine you could almost take one of those and hollow it out or something, but that's mm -hmm. very specific. Well, yeah, that would be, I think, turning. So that would be like on a lathe. And so there are beautiful, I've seen a lot of beautiful, beautiful urns of, of people um, making them and turning them on the lathe. But that, that's a whole different skill that- A whole different thing. I do not have. I've tried turning and it is not easy. It's it is harder than you'd think. Yeah, yeah. Well, I love it. Here I am like coming up with ideas. <laughs> like, woodworker, like, what do I know? Yeah. Oh, that's great. Well, yeah. what, um, what other, what do you think experiences have, you know, you talked about kind of having this comfort with um, end of life or as you got into the kind of positive death movement, you found that um, familiar or comfortable, like you weren't put off by it. Mm -hmm. What What do you think has brought that, brought you to that in your life? Well, in my life, there I've been no stranger to death. My first funeral was when I was five. My great grandmother, Busha, she lived to be 101 uh, she died when I was when I was five, and um, I don't know why or how, but there's been a lot of death in my family and in my uh, my friend group. So I've never been squicked out by death. I've never um, had to shy away from it, and so I'm very comfortable when people are expressing grief. And um, I know a lot of people sometimes get uncomfortable with some if someone's crying or if someone's grieving but I'm very comfortable just sitting in it and, you know, allowing them that space or allowing myself that space to grieve. And so I think I really, I don't think it's the reason I went into making urns, but I do think it's the reason I was so comfortable doing it so quickly and why um, coming into the death care space, you know, being so welcomed into that, you know, death care workers are very, very special people. And so being welcomed into that and, and people being so gracious with their time and with their knowledge to me was, was just such a wonderful experience. And so I think that comfortability, if that's a word, that comfortableness <laughs> that I have with death really allows me to be able to make these and also, you know, the customer service part of it where um, either, you know, people want to show me pictures of, of their loved ones or share stories with me or, um, you know, they're grieving. So maybe read everything on the website. And so I have to make some changes or, you know, not everyone is, I say half and half of my clients are people who've had their ashes for a long time and now have found my urns and want to use them or someone whose loved one has just passed away very recently. So they're going to be in a little bit of a different mind space than somebody just buying some makeup or socks online. And so I'm very aware of that. I'm very, and because of my history with death, I'm very aware of, um, I guess I have more empathy of what people are going through and I never forget it. I never forget what it is that I'm doing. I never, when I'm in the wood shop, I don't, it's not like I'm just churning these out. Uh, first of all, they take a long time to make, but also it's not just like, oh God, I gotta get in the wood shop. It's like, oh no, I'm making this custom piece for this person because it's for their dog and it, they kind of made it look like their dog or it's for this person's um, dad who was a gardener or was a woodworker. I love, I love those ones in particular. So I never, yeah, I never forget what these are and what an emotional and personal choice this is to be someone's final resting place. That's a big deal. 
as you know. And um, I'm just, yeah, I think it's a real honor to to do that for people. That's that's so beautiful, Cece. Do you do you typically make them custom or do you have some on hand? I have some on hand. Yeah. So I have uh, ready to ship ones because sometimes people need them right away. And so those ship next business day. And so I have like the again, like small, medium, large. And those are made primarily from pieces of wood that I might not be able to access all of the time. So it's a piece of spalted wood, it's a piece of you know, really highly figured wood or, or something like that. So I can't, I'm not able to replicate it. So I put that in as like kind of a one-off in the, in the ready to ship. And right. Then, so it's like, if you want that one, there it is, but exactly. I one of these more familiar pieces. Yeah, exactly. And so then I also have um, the made to order ones. So those ones are made from wood that is very um, available and it's going to look very, it, you know, of course, every piece of wood is different, but it's going to look very similar to the picture. And then I also do custom pieces. So if somebody sees something on my Instagram or they see a past piece on, on my on my site or they want to work with, you know, I've I've done this where I've gotten pieces of wood um, that I don't usually work with. I've you know been able to source different woods for people because they this wood was very special to this person or they have a lot of furniture that's that's this wood. So that's part of the custom process too. So it's the same shapes that I usually, that I make, but the wood choice is, is different. That makes so much sense. I, I appreciate what you're saying about as you work on it, you're aware of either who you're working it for or the family or just the whole context, even if it's a generic quote unquote one. And I right. I've had that experience making quilts where if I know who I'm making a quilt for, there's just some quality of like, while I'm sewing these, all these straight lines, they're just in my, in my consciousness, you know, I'm just sort of yep. aware that this quilt is for so-and-so. And I, I hold that in a slightly different way. And I think it really informs the creativity moving through and it's such a beautiful way. And I don't know. I like to think it's like cooking with love, you know, it's like sewing with love, woodworking with love. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Very well said. Well, thanks so much, Cece. This is such a really um, unique uh, possibility for people to consider. So you can find out more about Cece's work at voicestudio.com. You can look up things there. Um, and again, it's C period C period Boyce, Cece Boyce. And you can find out more about the work I do at Diane not at Diane, at bestlifebestdeath.com. Any final things you want to say, Cece? Oh, just thank you so much. This has been such an honor and um, I love talking about them. And if uh, if anybody wants to contact me, they can find me, like you said, voicestudio.com. And I'm very happy to talk to people. I do Zooms with people uh, to show them because sometimes it helps to see them you know, in real life, like you're seeing them right now. It's a little bit of a different experience than seeing them on photos. And so I'm, I'm very happy to do that too, to connect with people. Awesome. Well, thanks again, Cece. And um, you've been listening to the Best Life, Best Death podcast. Thanks for tuning in. So I'm just talking a little bit more here with Cece Boyce of boycestudio.com. And Cece, I was thinking about how you, you know, you really dove into this sort of in the last eight years, something like that, six, eight mm -hmm. years. And you you spoke in the podcast about getting involved in kind of the death positive community. That's really active in LA. Like who have you met or who have you talked to who's been kind of influential? Uh, Jill Shock, Death Doula LA was really generous with her time and her knowledge uh, with me at the beginning um, and, and remains a, a friend uh, and somebody I can bounce ideas off of or, you know, just text with questions She's really great at what she does. And I think she's been doing it a really long time. And um, it's, I, I found that most of the death positive movement and a lot of death care workers are women, which makes a lot of sense. You know, we're, we were midwives, death doulas, you know, it's the beginning and the you know, end of life. It makes a lot of sense to me. And that was another reason that I was so comfortable coming into this space because it was a lot of women that were very welcoming to me. It was beautiful. I always feel like, like, I always say like, we need a doula in every home, you know, mm -hmm. and I feel like we did have doulas, you know, in terms of aunts and mothers and grandmothers, we, that was all in place when people lived so much, um, you know, it, just in an earlier time, my husband yeah. and I are watching 1883 right now. <laughs> it's just like, 
pioneer <laughs> pre Yellowstone kind of this series that's on right now. And yeah, but I mean, I just could barely watch it for what people go through and how every day had death, you know, whether it's death mm -hmm. by or someone's run over by a cart or bit by a rattlesnake or stabbed or they get an infection. I mean, they just died so, so easily. And I'm so struck sometimes by the number of, you know, the number of people who didn't live and yeah. the number of people who lived so that I could be here now, right? That right. all of those people had to run that gamut of danger in those earlier years. Right. So, um, anyway, yeah, 1883, there's a little side note. <laughs> I'll have to check it out. Yeah. Um, the, the, I think too, I've been really struck by, were you already on Instagram before your studio or do they yes. kind of personal and professional went hand? Um, I think, oh gosh, no. Yeah, I was on, I was on, but not nearly as active as I am now, you know, with, with promoting the urns and showing people what I do. Yeah. It's I've, I have found it super interesting how there's this very active, um, end of life movement on yes, on Facebook, but even more so on Instagram. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it's like, I've gotten to know all these women that I sort of know, but don't know and, um, men as well. And just having these conversations. And then, uh, that caused me to three of them. I won't, I won't say their names cause I'll get them wrong. The, the, you know, their handles on Instagram, mm -hmm. but three doulas who are in different parts of the country are going to come on the Conscious Dying Institute alumni night phone call that the Conscious Dying Institute holds. And I just was so inspired one day. I thought, oh, I should just reach out to these three women I chat with on Instagram and see if they want to come lead this phone call. So there's there's this whole, I think, a big upsurge of people being involved and people being interested and people who've been in it a long time, like Jill, people who are newer, like me. Mm -hmm. um, but there's this real community out there of people who I think at the base really want to impact the conversation about end of life and um, create something different. Yeah, I agree. And I think um, having those conversations and actually, and uh, everyone being very transparent about what's going on, about their own lives, about what they're going through, about what their clients have gone through. There's a lot of cool stuff, a lot of hospice nurses too on Instagram telling people, I've learned a lot just from watching them about, about end of life and what's expected and what, you know, and they're really taking the mystery and the fear away because once you know, oh, they're supposed to be breathing like that, that's the act of dying process. This is secretions, you know, things like that, that I didn't know before, but right. that just takes the mystery and the fear out of it as you know, the knowledge can help somebody be there for their, their family member and not, you know, have to, I, I don't want to say run away, but, you know, just helping somebody navigate that end of life space. I just had uh, one of my best friends was um, caring for her dying mother. And we are having those conversations about, okay, this is normal. And this is very heavy, but it, but she said also the process was beautiful, you know, seeing her mom, reaching out for people, you know, at, at, you know, the, the visions, you know, that a lot of people see at the end of life and she, and, but because she knew that stuff prior, it wasn't scary. And so I think that that is really such a benefit of, of the death care space and the positive death movement. It's taking the mystery and the taboo out of it really empowers people. I think so too. I think so too. And, and what you said, the, you know, the classic Barbara Carnes quote is knowledge reduces fear. Mm -hmm. And if we know more, then it's a little less freaky. And I think this thing about, I yeah, Barbara Carnes' other quote that I've got a great sweatshirt is that um, people don't die like they do in the movies. And so we do, we have this kind of image that they're just going to kind of quietly go. And it's a labor, it's a process, it takes time. And mm -hmm. I heard a beautiful quote the other day on a um, the When You Die Project had a live mm -hmm. webinar that was so lovely. And one of the doctors on there, he said, our bodies know how to die and our spirits know how to soar. And there's just this giving over to yourself to love at that time. If you're conscious and able to do that, that's what you can focus on. And I just loved that. Wow. Quote. Your bodies know what they're, what it's doing and our spirits know what they're doing too. It's just, yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. Well, thanks. I love that you grounded your, your art and your cremation urns in like in a specific 
community, so to speak. And I mean that at a big level, like capital C community, but like this positive death space community is such an interesting, I think it's such an interesting movement right now. Yeah. Yeah, me too. I'm excited to see what happens to moving forward. We've gotten away, you know, like we, going back to what you were talking about, 1883, we were so familiar with death and so close to it kind of in that time. And so, and somehow along the way we got removed from it and be, it became very scary or quote unquote gross. And now I think we're kind of moving back to, okay, we're, we're handling this now, but maybe in a different way, a more informed way and a less scary way. Yeah. Yeah. There's this amazing Ted talk. I was just showing a class yesterday um, by Dr. Oh, what's his first name? Well, it's Dr. Hillman. Mm -hmm. And the Ted talk is from Australia. And he says, basically in the 1950s and 60s, we developed all this technology that ended up making ICU this amazing thing that could keep people alive. Mm. But he said, you know, when I started working as an ICU doctor, there were four beds in my ICU unit. And he said, now I work in a large medical center with 40 beds. Every one of them costs 4,000 Australian dollars a day. And this was this TED talk is from a few years ago. And he said, and the bigger problem is that the people occupying those ICU beds are mostly in their last days or weeks of life. And he said, it's just gotten flipped where because we can keep people alive, we mm. do keep people alive, but not, not, it's not always what we want. So yeah, I think we have to look at these issues really carefully while we can and then make the best choices and communicate those choices that, that matter for us, you know, everybody's right. individual. I've seen a lot of stuff on Instagram as well about uh, educating people on your end of end of life uh, plans, your wishes of, you know, do you want to be on life support or, or, you know, your, your pre-planned, you know, what do you want done with your body? And so I think a lot of people too, are, if they're planning for that, then they can let people know, no, please let me die, you know, naturally or, or, you know, they want to be home on hospice. They don't want to be in an ICU bed. I think the educate part of the positive death movement, educating people on making their plans and their wishes known, I think is going to help with that a lot too, you know, the pre yeah. you know, preparation. And then it's so not one conversation. It's really multiple conversations over yeah. time. It's yep. uncomfortable, but we have to do it. I, I love the organization Five Wishes. You know, they have some really good forms that you can just simply fill out and start these conversations. Yeah, Jill did that for me. Jill just sent me a bunch of stuff. She's like, here, because I was like, what do I do? And she's like, here, fill all these out. And I'm like, this couldn't be easier, you know? And it's, and it's, they really make it simple and it's not so daunting of, you know, and you don't have to have a lawyer making it like a big old will if you don't have a lot of, uh, it, uh, your possessions, you can do it yourself. And what and, if you have a yeah. lot of wood scraps that no one <laughs> don't understand know. how important they are? <laughs> they're just going to throw our scraps away. No, they're going to go to another, uh, other woodworkers are going to feel it in the air and they're going to know and they're going to come to them and find them. I know it. I know it. <laughs> I love it. All right. Well, thanks for a little bonus time, Cece. This of course. Is of course. My pleasure. Mm -hmm.